Uh, my message today is, what is hope? What is hope? Turn to your neighbor and say, what is hope? I gotta wake you up a little bit, it's a 9 a.m. service. Um, if you're brand new, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background. Um, we're in the book of Daniel. Now, the book of Daniel, it's exilic literature. All that means, it's uh, that God's people are in exile. It's one of the few books in the Old Testament where God's people are in exile. Uh, if you want to hear all the background, the first week I shared a lot of the background of the book of Daniel. Another thing we know about uh, Daniel is they're exiled in Babylon. Old Testament, uh, it shows us that uh, Babylon is a city. The New Testament shows that Babylon is a spirit. And so now we see in scripture, uh, like 1 Peter uh, 5, 3, he says to my sister church located in Babylon. Now, hold on a second. They're not located in Babylon. They're lo located in Rome. What Peter is saying is, hey, you're exiles also because you live in Rome, but they have a Babylon spirit. And so you are foreigners in this land. Well, just to give you a heads up, we are also in exile. So, so if there's a book that we could read in this time, the book of Daniel is a great one to read. It's going to teach us how to navigate through the spirit of Babylon. You see the spirit of Babylon in Revelation 17, 18. Not only that, Babylon was uh, modern day Iraq now. It's modern day Iraq. Uh, we established also uh, that uh, the book of Daniel is this amazing book of famous stories. You got uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a furnace. You got Daniel's in the lion's den. Uh, you got a bunch of prophecies in the, uh, the second half of Daniel. But really the book of Daniel is about a man who lives with hope, humility, and honor. You're not gonna get through a Babylon type season without hope, humility, and honor. Oh, those are crucial. It almost gets hidden with the big stories of the furnace and the lions, but really what sustains everything is hope in God, humility that God's the one who's gonna take care of it, and honoring everybody, even though maybe they don't deserve to be honored, because when you honor, it enables you to preach the gospel. Does that sound good? All right, let's get into the word. Come on now, Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29. Uh, it says this, this is what the Lord Almighty God of Israel says. This is our theme verse for the series. Uh, to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Again, God carried them into exile. What's happening right now in California is not an accident. God is up to something. Come on. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. I love that. This is one of my favorite verses right here, verse 7. Also seek peace and prosperity for Walnut Creek, Alamo, Danville, Martinez, Concord. Seek peace and prosperity for all the Bay Area. I'm going to throw San Francisco in even. Does that sound good? <laughs> seek it for it. Come on now. Let's keep going. Uh, pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Let's fast forward down to the very end. It's one of the most famous verses. He goes on to say, uh, for when the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise. Some of you, if I could just, if I could speak to somebody's heart today, you've been waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. God, I know that there's more. God, I know that this isn't all you have for me. I've, I've been just sitting, I feel like I've been on the sidelines. I feel like I've just been in the valley. And God says, I've, I'm going to come fulfill this good promise. It's one of the most famous verses in all the Bible. Come on, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you. Come on, stop planning and let his plans come to fruition. Come on, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope. Everybody say hope again. Hope. It's big to say hope. hope. That was like four of you. Come on now, you're going to hurt my feelings if you don't do that. <laughs> give you hope and a future. Hope and a future. Now let's just be honest. You know, hope, you hear it all the time in church. Hey, just keep on hoping. But what is hope? Like, what is it? Is it something you put in your back pocket when you leave the day? Is hope a really nice quote, you know, from C.S. Lewis, because we all quote C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors. Hope isn't thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking about yourself less. What? Okay, kind of, but not really. Hope is more than that. Let me, uh, let, let's actually find out what hope is. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. I got a lot of scripture today. I think that's a good thing. 1 Peter 1 is the sister chapter to Daniel. It's the sister book. It is written to the Babylonian exiles also in the New Testament. And it's, you'll see it right here. To God's elect, to God's chosen. You've been chosen by God, ready? Exiles scattered throughout the province of Pontius, Galatia, Capit let's stop that. To the, to, the, um, to the exiles scattered through the Bay Area, Walnut Creek, Alamo, Danville, San Ramon, Concord, Clayton, La Mirinda, Martinez, I could keep going. To the exiles who've been scattered through the Bay Area. Come on, you better read scripture like it's written to you. Yeah. God's talking to you today. Yeah. Who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. You got a lot of grace and abundance right now for people? You got a lot of peace? Those two are connected. When you get angry at people, it's because you don't got grace for people. And when you get angry with people, you ain't got no peace. That's why I deleted my Facebook last week. 
I don't have the grace yet, so I can't have the Facebook yet. <laughs> I'm just gonna be honest, okay. God said, if you can't be trusted with it, I'm gonna take it. <laughs> all right. A couple things that this teaches us in 1 Peter 1 and 2. First of all, it is no accident that you are here right now. Can I tell you something? You're in the right place at the right time for the right moment. God is going to use you in the Bay Area. Come on now. We always question, God, what do you have for where am I supposed to? No, God scatters. It says he scatters. Let me, let me show, you, show you this. I love this verse. The exiles scattered throughout the provinces. Just like a good farmer that scatters seed throughout a place. He scatters Christians throughout the Bay Area. And why does he scatter that seed? Why does he scatter Christians? So it says that we have the fruit of the Spirit. It calls us like a plant or like a tree, that we would produce a fruit that other people would enjoy, a shade that other people would enjoy. You have been scattered on purpose. You have been planted by the good farmer. Woo, I came to preach today. Okay, let's, let's keep going, okay? Okay. I've got a good word for you. Uh, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and his great mercy has given us a new birth. Everybody say new birth. New birth. That's salvation. He's given you salvation. So, so your old life is gone and your new life is here. If, you, if you've been saved before and you've never been saved, I'm gonna tell you about salvation real quick. If you don't know Jesus, it says that you are spiritually dead. And when you are spiritually dead, you don't hear the things of God, you don't live for God, you, your flesh is alive and so you just live for the world only. And then there comes this moment, I was 16 when I came to life, I heard the gospel message and I came to life and I realized, whoo, Basketball isn't my fulfillment. God is my fulfillment. Oh, my girlfriend isn't my fulfillment. No, no, no. God, you're the only one that can satisfy this soul. It's amazing when you wake up to the things of God. I was going to entitle this message when the light goes on. When the, when the, when the, when the, the flip switches, you just see things differently. Because in the new birth in 1 Peter, you'll see this. Hope. Hope is needed for the church. Humility and honor again. And it says that the church has those three things, just like Daniel. Guess what happens? We live in harmony in the church. Oh, what if we lived in harmony as a church? Ne never do it, Lord. Come on, baby girl. Um, do it. Again. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Come on. Um, never before my 17 years, I was at a pastor's retreat for about uh, a couple days, and guys who have pastored many more years than me, 30, 40 years, uh, guys who have been alive a lot longer, he's like, I've never seen it this divisive. There is a crack in the roof right now in church, and politics have seeped in. Preference has seeped in. You know, and just one little preference. You mask or no mask. You vax or no vax. And right away, bam, no harmony. Because the prideful say you gotta be not vaxxed. The prideful say you gotta be vaxxed. But the humble say, I have no idea what it's supposed to be. And when you're humble, you have harmony. A lot of arrogant people have ideas on how we're supposed to live right now. You don't know how we're supposed to live. I don't know how we're supposed to live. Yeah, I said it mean like that. I was kind of angry like that, right? No. <laughs> he knows how we're supposed to live. Making life about those things instead of the kingdom of God? Oh, oh. It goes new birth into a living hope, a living hope. There's your definition. It's a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. No, hope isn't something you grab. It's not something you take. Hope isn't something. Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. Hope is a person. Hope grows. It's not something you just get and you just put it on the shelf. It's something that needs to be tended to like a marriage, like a relationship, like a plant. It is a living thing. And living things either grow or they die. And the reason they die is because they've been neglected. They've been neglected because you haven't given them time. They've been neglected because you're not giving them humility, honor, and harmony. They've been neglected. But when you start to come to God with humility, hope, and honor, something happens with that hope. And not only do you have hope for yourself, but you start carrying hope for other people. So on Monday, when something else comes out, maybe a new mandate, the news says something, you're carrying hope, you're not carrying dread. Let's pray. God, we give you today's message. Oh Lord, may, may today be a day where we hear your truth and it doesn't just pump us up for today, but it changes our life forever. Lord, I pray for those who are far from God right now, if they're in the room or they're somewhere in our community, Lord, that you start working on their heart and they would come to know you. Lord, I pray for sleepy, sleepy Christians right now, Christians that have just been living for themselves and today the light turns on and they realize that there's nothing better than living for their God. Lord, if they're in the room or they're in the community, Lord, we pray for them right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray my words fall to the floor, that your words soar. God, we need you, we need you, we need you. And everybody said? Well, we're going to be in my favorite chapter of all of Daniel today. My favorite chapter of all of Daniel. And it's the salvation story of King Nebuchadnezzar. Let's call him King Nebi. All right? Because I think when I get to heaven, I'm going to call him King Nebi. Uh, now, Nebuchadnezzar is the same guy who's like, kill them all destroying cities, arrogant, prideful. This is the same king that I wanted to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace. 
This is one of the most arrogant people in all the world. He's one of the most tormented people in all the world. It's one of those guys, if I could just be honest, he's one of the few people in all the world that made it to the very top of the food chain. Most powerful empire, top 20 in all the world. Nobody, he answers to nobody. Wow. And you think somebody who answers to nobody would have everything, but really he's empty and he's tormented and he's having sleepless nights. And in Daniel 4, he gets saved. And can I, can I just give you a little salvation and encouragement real quick? Um, I got an uh, email a while ago, and it, it, it was you know, one of those things where I, I already had the stats in my head, but did you know that church is at an all-time low right now, attendance-wise, in America? Under 50%. It's in the 40%. That, 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 you forget that at first, and it just makes you go, man, is everything going to be okay, God? God, what are you doing? But can I just tell you real quick that casual Christianity died during COVID? That crossless Christianity died during COVID? Let me give it another name. Cruise ship Christianity died during COVID. God is doing a new thing, okay? He's, I love it, it says this. This is actually during the Babylon time too in Isaiah 43, it says this. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforces together, they lay here never to rise again. Extinguished, snuffed out like a wick, saying, hey, you remember Babylon? I'm gonna take care of Babylon. You don't gotta worry about it. But the way he takes care of Babylon, maybe they're not gonna be the way that you'd wanna take care of Babylon. If I could just get a new governor, a new city official, everything would be fine. No, no, no. God takes care of it better than you do and than I do. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Man, that has been a verse for me. March 8th, 2020. My favorite service we've ever had at Mission Church until a few weeks ago. We had baptisms. One of our all-time service highs, uh, attendance-wise. We were, we, like, for like two months straight, 10 plus salvations every Sunday. We had, we had 1,000 salvations in two years. 800 people come to church in two years in the Bay Area. I get calls from people from all around the nation. What are you doing, Tyler? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I have no clue, to be honest. And then March 9th came, 21 days to flatten the curve. <laughs> maybe, maybe we're on day 20 right now. I don't know where I am. I know it's not over. And so I lament, it's like, God, you were doing such a good thing. Why, Lord, I felt like it was like winning our sales. People were getting saved. A ton of people were coming. And then COVID hit. And then we opened up on Saturdays. And like 100 people came in that room. And they just looked at me the whole time. And nobody was worshiping. What's happening? <laughs> That's what I felt. Saturday sucked. <laughs> Hated them. <laughs> you can laugh now. because. But you were laughing, I was crying. Right. Hated him. Turn to Isaiah. Forget the past, Tyler. I'm doing a new thing. I don't want you to build a cruise ship house. I want you to build a battleship. I don't want you to build a huge house with casual Christians because they come and they kind of like it. I want the house to be built up of disciples. There's a cost to Christianity now. Come on, there's a cost to this. If you're watching right now, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. You're not here. I want you to hear something real quick. If you have health stuff and that's why you're not here right now, I want you to know we're doing everything we can to get live stream back up on Sundays. I believe that we should serve uh, people in that way. So we're going to get live stream up. But if you're not coming to church more because you just got a bad habit, mm, mm, mm. it's not good. You know, I mean, I mean, I'll be honest, like, like COVID killed the cruise industry. It really did. Like the legit cruise industry. Like cruise ships are done but also killed cruise ship Christians. I'll come back when it gets easy. I'll come back when you have the drinks like you had before. I'll come back when you have the chair that I really like to sit in. That's not why we're supposed to have church. Oh, thank God COVID happened. It's the first time I said that. <laughs> Didn't even, that wasn't in my message. I almost felt weird saying it. But thank God it happened. God is building something. He's building new believers. He's awakening sleepy Christians, realizing that the world cannot satisfy me. Let's keep going. I haven't even started my message. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't worry. If you've been here before, I, I preach really short sermons. <laughs> I'm setting people up today. <laughs> all right. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. It's my favorite book uh, in all the Bible, uh, in all of Daniel, excuse me. And I just want to read you the end. I can't read you all of it today. I want you to go home and read all of Daniel 4. Um, it's an amazing book. It's an amazing book. It starts with uh, Nebuchadnezzar being terrified and having sleepless nights. Then it goes into him having his wilderness season because of his arrogance and his pride. 
His pride will not have him turn to God. So therefore he goes into literally the wilderness and lives like an animal, is an animal basically. And he gets saved and humbled in that moment. And then this is his, this is his salvation testimony. It's an amazing thing. And if I'm being honest, a lot of our testimonies look very similar to Nebuchadnezzar. It starts with anxiety and pressure and worry and torment and sleepless nights. And then we try to do it in our own strength and we drive ourselves in the wilderness thinking that we can do it ourselves. And then finally, when we realize we can't save our own life and save our own marriage and have everything we thought we could have with just finances and hard work, we finally humble ourselves and we celebrate the one who created us and that can satisfy our soul. Oh, it's an amazing thing. Let me read you Daniel 4. After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting, and his kingdom is eternal. Ooh. Now, now, a lot of you are like, hold on a second. I remember Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar celebrated and said, oh, your God is the best God. Daniel 3 was Nebuchadnezzar never saying my God. He was just celebrating their God. Now, some of you, you celebrate everybody else's God, but he needs to become your God. He doesn't need to be my most high. He needs to become your most high. He don't need to be my priority. He needs to become your priority. There's a huge shift between, oh, yeah, yeah, I like Jesus too. Oh, he's everything to me. So Nebuchadnezzar takes a chasm shift in Daniel 4. Let's keep going. His rule is everlasting. His kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? When my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory and kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored as the head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify the honor of the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. That's his testimony story. The Bible says in Revelation, the way we defeat the enemy is by the blood of the lamb. People need to know the gospel. By the power of the testimony, they need to know what God saved you from. Nebuchadnezzar got saved from his pride, from thinking he could do life on his own. And last but not least, the other way we defeat the enemy, he says, not loving your life too much. A.K.A. not loving the world too much. That's how we defeat the enemy. I, I love how he finishes it. He humbled the proud. He's saying, he humbled me, everybody. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have Nebuchadnezzar share his testimony with you today. And I, wanna, I just want to have hope grow today. I want, I want, I want this, this scripture to, to increase your faith. I want it to also calibrate your faith. I want it to calibrate your hope. And when you walk out of here, you realize, man, my, my hope is just getting started. Does that sound good? So five things that Nebuchadnezzar shares in his testimony throughout all of Daniel 4. And uh, I'm going to share with you. I'm going to give you some tools to run the race well. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is going to tell you the tricks of Babylon and the things to watch out for Babylon, the things that kill hope. Does that sound good? First one uh, Nebuchadnezzar would tell you in his testimony story is uh, found in Daniel 4, uh, verse 4. Um, don't run the wrong race. That's the first thing he would tell you. Don't run the wrong race. In Babylon, watch out for the wrong race is what Nebuchadnezzar was going to tell you. Let me show you right, real quick. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. I don't know about you, but a lot of Christians want God to just give them comfort and prosperity. And Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, that's Babylon. Babylon's goal is get the palace, get the comfort, get the prosperity. Sounds a lot like the American dream. Huh? Eh? Huh? The American dream is not the gospel. It's not the gospel. Man, comfortable Christians are ineffective Christians. I'm going to be honest. Christians who are seeking prosperity from the world instead of things of heaven, they're distracted Christians. And so Nebuchadnezzar goes, hey, I ran the race better than all y'all. I had the best palace, the most, most comfort, and I had the most prosperity. Do you know that he had one of the seven wonders of the world built on his palace? So when the seven wonders of the world was a garden, he's like, I want the best garden, build it. Became one of the seven wonders of the world. You realize that people usually make it to the top. This is a very normal thing that happens. There is this rhythm in, throughout history. The ones at the top are the most tormented. Watch, any doc watch Howard Hughes, gets to the top, tormented. Because you get to the top and you're like, hold on, I ran this race and I got everything that Babylon has to offer and I still can't sleep. Goes on to say, he just goes on to say he had a terrible dream that woke him up, terrified him as he laid in bed. Uh, one of my favorite stories in, uh, that I've ever heard was written by Wayne Cordero in one of his uh, books. And he talks about a true story about the Olympics, about a Olympic marathon runner who uh, as the race went on, the gun fires in a marathon, true story, mid, uh, uh, early 1900s, gun fired, the marathon runner left, marathons are 26 plus miles. Anybody ever ran a marathon? 
Where are my crazy people at? Yeah. Yeah, cra- hey, use that crazy faith for Jesus, okay? Um, marathon runners, I, I've, I've thought about it, and I stopped. So anyways, um, I didn't even pray about it. Just thought about it. So, so the marathon starts, uh, and again, Olympic athletes, two, to two hours, I don't even know what they, it's so fast now. Um, but uh, so the gun goes off, and they start running, and a few hours later, the first person comes in, and as he comes in, the crowd goes nuts. <sighs> he's running, and he's running, and the crowd goes nuts, and he falls down, and his coach comes up and tries to pick him up. And the judge says, if you touch him, he's disqualified. So everybody's screaming in the car, get up, get up, get up. And so he gets up, starts running, falls again one more time. They yell, get up. He finally gets up, and he crosses the finish line, so he thinks, and the crowd goes nuts, and he thinks he wins. Everybody comes in, finishes the race. The names come on the board, and his name is nowhere to be found. And his coach goes nuts. Where, hey, where, where's, where's my guy? He's not on the board. And he goes, Judge goes, hey, in the very beginning of the race, we said that was the starting line. The finish line is 50 meters uh, over there. He never finished the race. How sad would it be if you spent your whole life running the wrong race because the crowd cheered for you? How sad would it be if you spent your whole life going, woo, I got a promotion. Everybody said congratulations. How sad would it be if you're like, oh, guess what I got now? I got the, oh, you got the new house. Congratulations. You got the house, but you don't got the spirit. You got the house, but you don't got the joy in the house. Oh, you got the promotion, but really you manipulated for it and it just don't feel that good. There's something to be said from when King Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, don't run the wrong race. I ran that race. It doesn't have it for you. So many of us as believers, if we're being honest, we get saved and we say, God, help me finish my race. You get saved and you never even got on the new track. You stayed on the worldly track and saying, God, I got saved. And it's great that you got saved, but you're missing out on all the things of heaven because you're trying to have God get you all the things of the world. If you could just take the wisdom from Nebuchadnezzar today, the reason why you're so tormented and tired is because you're running the wrong race. Nebuchadnezzar said, this race never ends. It's, oh, it's just so tiring. But if you run the right race, there's hope in it. There's grace in it. There's, there's joy in it. You're running with other people. Don't run the wrong race. Second point, King Nebuchadnezzar would tell you in his testimony is listen to godly advice. Listen to godly advice. Let me show it to you real quick. So Nebuchadnezzar has this terrible dream, brings in people that don't know it, brings in uh, uh, Daniel for the dream. The dream is basically Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this big tree and it gets cut down to the stump. And the dream represents Nebuchadnezzar is the big tree, the biggest tree of all the trees in all the world. And it gets cut down to a stump. It's terrifies him because he knows it's him that's going to be cut down to a stump. And so he's terrified. He wants Daniel to come in and tell him maybe something better. But this is what Daniel says. This is what the dream means, your majesty, and what the Most High has declared will happen to my Lord, the King. You'll be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow, and you'll be drenched with dew of heaven. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way. You're like, this is such a weird story. Where, where else could you find this in the Bible? You find it with the prodigal son. He's with the pigs, and he sees that the pigs are eating better than him. The animals, you know, live like an animal when you... It's a different sermon for a different day. Let's keep going. Okay. You will eat the grass like a cow, and you'll be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time will pass. Seven periods of time is seven years. Seven years will pass, and the, uh, um, uh, will pass while you live this way until you learn that the most high rules. Until you learn. Some of you need to learn today. Until you learn that God needs to be first, you'll never have fulfillment. Until you learn that God needs to be a priority, you'll never have fulfillment. Until you learn the priority of prayer, you'll never have peace. Until you learn that the word of God should be read every day, you'll never have real direction and the real wisdom. Until you learn. Let me keep going. I don't know why I was talking like this. Um, <laughs> until you learn. Let's keep going. Uh, high rules over the king. Get over there. Get over here. Uh, over the high kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. But the stumps and the roots of the tree were left in the ground. So thankful that God did cut us down to a stump, but he left a stump. You'll see in Isaiah that it says that the root of Jesse is cut down to a stump, but out of that stump comes Jesus. When you're down to nothing, God's up to something. This is scripture. Don't, 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 be, don't be upset if you've been cut down to nothing. Out of that stump, Jesus comes out of it. Come on now. And we're left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. Some of you just need to learn heaven rules. It's, it's just that simple. If, you, it's just, if just Christians could learn that, that God's in charge, heaven rules, 
Heaven's supposed to come. If you make those your priorities, your life would be a thousand times better. You'd have so much more peace, you'd sleep better. Let's keep going. King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. This is the Daniel, godly man. Please accept my advice. Nobody turn around, you prideful man. You're walking this way. Repent and turn to accept my godly advice. He goes, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. It's like, if I'm being honest, it's like somebody who's like the greatest foodie in the world. So if we got any foodies, who loves going out to eat? Where are my foodies at? I love talking to a food. I'm like, hey, give me your best restaurant. And now, so when I go to Napa, you know, I remember when I first moved here, people were like, the greatest restaurant in the world is their French laundry, you know? And can you imagine if I had a free dinner at French laundry, you gave me advice and said, please listen to my advice. You gotta go to French laundry. It is one of the greatest meals you ever on the planet. And I go and I end up going to Carl's Jr. instead. <laughs> You're like, why didn't you take my advice? I don't know, I just really like Carl's Jr. I've always liked the burgers, I eat them all the time. I don't know, maybe French laundry is better, but whatever. What, how foolish it would be not to listen to the best foodie's advice to say, turn around from Carl's Jr. and go to French Laundry. <laughs> nah, I'm going to have Carl's Jr. Can we say that's foolish? Yes? Yeah. I got one more illustration like that. Hold on a second. <laughs> if I'm buying a car and I'm talking to a car expert and they say, hey, this is the best car you can buy on the planet. Fill in the blank. I don't know what it is right now. I have a Jeep Wrangler. Very low on the consumer ratings. 50,000 miles, it started falling apart. I still bought it. So. Anyways, but let's say they say the best car is a, suppose I was talking to a guy who's actually a car guy, works for um, a car company, uh, hopped around, now he's working for Tesla. I said, what's the best like, just car that like, runs well, that bang, best bang for the buck out of all the big car companies? He goes, to be honest, he's like, Lexus. He's like, Lexus makes great cars. It's Toyota, like, they just make great cars that run forever, bang for the buck. So if he told me, hey, Tyler, go buy a Lexus. And I was like, no, I'm going to go buy a Fiat. A Fiat. <laughs> Which is the lowest ranked car you can buy right now. I Googled it. If you have one, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> He'd be like, but you just got a car advice from a really smart car person. You walked right by him. So now let's talk about your life, your marriage, your dreams, everything you hold dear to yourself. And the word of God says, turn around and live this way. And you go, eh, I'm going to live this way anyways. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar did that. Daniel says, turn around, live this way. And Nebuchadnezzar goes, nah, I like my way. I like it my way. What I say goes. I'm a, that's Usher for you, 1990, whatever. <laughs> Usher, usher. Okay. Um, <laughs> nobody's caused you more harm than you. And I know you hate hearing that. I hate hearing it. I'm not talking to somebody today who was abused as a young person or abused in a marriage. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about every week that you live disobeying God, you're harming yourself. Every week that you decide to do your own thing, you're just causing no fruit. And if you would listen to godly advice, oh, what would have happened in your life and the glory that would be brought into God? Let's keep going. Third thing Nebuchadnezzar says. Pride makes you stupid. Nebuchadnezzar tells you, pride makes you stupid. Let me read this to you real quick. Ready? So Nebuchadnezzar's response to this as he doesn't listen to godly advice. says, but all these things did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later. So he gets the godly advice, 12 months goes by. Do not confuse God's patience for his approval. Ecclesiastes 8 says this, when people do something wrong and they're not punished, they think they're going to get away with it and they run to do evil. And so just because he got away with something doesn't mean God approved of it. It's just because he's a really kind, patient, merciful God. And there's this time frame in between where he's like, repent, 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 repent. If not, I'm going to I'm gonna have to come in. You know, have you ever heard somebody say this? There's a blessing with your name on it. No, no, there's a desert with your name on it. There's a wilderness with your name on it. And God's like, repent, repent, repent. I, 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 one of my tools is the wilderness. One of my tools is the desert. You repent, you use wisdom, pain or wisdom, which one you want to choose. 12 months goes by, and in spite of God giving him godly advice, 12 months later, he was taking a walk on the flat roof of his royal palace, overlooking one of the seven wonders of the world, probably impressed with himself. As he looked out across the city, he said, look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I've built this beautiful city. 
as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. If you keep reading at that moment is when he starts going mad and gets driven to the wilderness. Can I just tell you real quick? I'm going I'm to unpack pride real quick. Pride is sneaky, and I want to expose it. Pride is lethal. It's nasty. It destroys. And so I've, just, I've been on this journey of looking at scripture, praying, God, will you give me revelation? Will you give me ways to communicate it? Truths on how to communicate pride. One of the first things that we see in the scripture is pride just leaves no room for God. Like, like what Nebuchadnezzar is doing, he's, he's committing cosmic plagiarism. I authored this. I built all this. I did all this. I am, because here's what, why he does got no room. Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I'm the author of my book. I'm the star of my book. I'm the editor of my book. I did everything. I'm writing my whole story. How can God be the author, the editor, and the star if you think you're the star, the editor, or the author? And the reality is, is pride says, I'm writing my story. Humility says, God, write my story. Pride says, I'm the star of the show. I'm entitled to this. I shouldn't be going through bad things. I, I, I did this and I'm amazing. But humility says, God, you're the star. I just want to bring glory to your name. Pride says, I'm the editor. I can fix my wrongs. I can fix this. I can do this. I'll rewrite it. I can make sure everything's better. But humility says, God, I have created a train wreck. And if you could write the greatest redemption story in this chapter and write the next chapter with your new mercies, because your new mercies are new every morning, every chapter has a new mercy in it, and I can live my life, whoo, humility gets you to a new chapter. Pride keeps you in the same chapter. The same chapter. Let's, let's keep going. Pride is lethal. Pride is lethal. It says this, while these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. You are no longer ruler of your life. Salvation moments, there's three things that happen in a salvation moment. First one is that you realize that you are in need of a savior. And once you realize that, and some people you haven't realized that yet, you realized you wanted an assistant, but you didn't realize you need a savior and a Lord. And so you realize it, then you receive God, and then you repent, and you start living for God. This is the process of salvation. And so Nebuchadnezzar needs to realize it. He goes, you need to realize you're not the kingdom. You're not the ruler of this kingdom. I'm going to show you you're not the ruler of this kingdom. Now, if I could just tell you something, Genesis 6 says sin is like a crouching animal waiting to pounce on you at the door. Just, if you just crack it open, it just wants to own you and rule you and master you. Pride is one of the most lethal things on the planet. Uh, you know, uh, some people actually call it one of the seven deadly sins. Now, l- let me unpack why pride is so lethal. Pride destroys everything. It destroys relationships. It steals time. Uh, Rachel and I have been married for nine years, and one of the harder things for spouses to say to each other is just, it's a simple word, but it's just, it's just hard to say. It's like, so, so. And then, then, you, then you go to this, sorry, you feel that way. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, you, you uh, received it that way, but you never only just, you, you learn how to say sorry in different ways, but you're not saying sorry, you know? And so I, I learned, you know, c- a couple years in, and I, I don't know, um, but I say sorry quicker. Is it okay? If, can I say that? I'm great at saying sorry. <laughs> I'm great. She said, she said, I'm just better at it. Well, I guess, yeah, it's all, it's all relative, right? So I'm better at it. I'm a peacemaker at heart. So I'm like, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. And I'll, I'll say sorry. Rachel was an only child and she's not very good at it. <laughs> and so our first five years, we fought for a while. Nobody would surrender. I remember we got in a big fight in Napa one time and, and like we're just driving there and, and I asked Rachel that we could leave at a certain time and, and I'm preaching the next day and she decided to stay for another 45 minutes and I just felt disrespected. I felt like she didn't, wasn't honoring my next day and I didn't want to go to Napa on a Saturday because I'm, I'm preparing my heart, my mind to preach the word of God, you know? And, and so I told Rachel, I'll go, but we got to leave by five. We get in the car at 5.30 and I'm just like, <laughs> she's like, what? I was like, I said, I knew it. 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 And she's like, what? I was like, I knew we we're going to stay later. I was, like, I was like, I feel like you don't even care. I just feel like you didn't even care about me at this moment, you know? And Rachel's like, oh my gosh, you're acting crazy. <laughs> you want your spouse to act crazy? Tell them they're acting crazy. <laughs> oh, I'm crazy. I'm crazy for you wanting you to keep your word. I'm crazy for wanting to be home early on Saturday so I can rest and preach. I'm crazy, you know? <laughs> So we're just gonna fight. And we're driving. 45 minutes, nobody breaks. The next day I was preaching on grace, by the way. <laughs> Preach on grace. 
I look at my girl, and she didn't have to say sorry because I was preaching on grace. And I was like, we got 45 minutes stolen from us that we'll never get back. 45 minutes of car ride where we could have been laughing, talking about life. We just lived in anger for 45 minutes. There's no grace. And so I forgave her without her saying sorry. <laughs> now, now, we did have a talk a little bit later. I said, babe, sorry is my kryptonite. You could set my car on fire. And if you said sorry, I'd be cool. I just need to hear sorry. I just need to hear that you, it hurts you that you hurt me. Just needs that it bothered you that it bothered me. I just need to hear sorry. And so Rachel has been working on it. <laughs> so about six months ago, we work out every morning at seven and I'm like, babe, we gotta be on time because you know we gotta get to work now and all that kind of stuff. And um, I was like, and she gets, and I was like, so I'm sitting in the car and it's 15 minutes late. 7.15, I'm sitting in the car, all right, I'm just waiting. Because you know, like, the reality is you wanna be on time to something, you can be on time to something. It's pretty easy. Wake up 15 minutes earlier, okay? Take a shower 15 minutes earlier, right? So we get in the car and Rachel knows I'm upset and she looks at me and she goes, I'm sorry, I know your time is valuable. <laughs> like a robot. I'm sorry, your time is valuable to me. I will uh, answer the call in one, two seconds. I'm like, what is happening right now? But at that moment, I was like, hey, you gotta start somewhere, girl. You gotta start somewhere. <laughs> I received the sorry. You have identified why I was upset. You owned it, kinda. Words are felt more than they're heard. And I received that sorry. Some of you. Pride destroys relationships. Humility knits relationships. Can I just tell you real quick? Man, start getting humble. Pride destroys, oh, just pride destroys things. I wanna give you a couple uh, little things on pride real quick and uh, we'll, uh, we'll finish up. Uh, pride's an attitude, is loud. Pride says this. Pride says, I'm the leader. Humility says, I'm the follower. As you're going this week, remember that. Another thing pride says, pride makes, pride makes you stupid. I, I said this morning, pride says, partner with me, God. How stupid is it to think that we have a better idea than God? That's just silly. But humility says, I wanna partner with you. We talked about that uh, um, uh, just uh, a second ago. Pride is sneaky. Humility says, I can do nothing apart from God. Sneaky pride says, I did some of this. I did a little bit, right? Just a little, just a little bit. Did you decide to be born in this era? Did you be, decide to be born to the parents you were born to? Or did you, did you get decided to the people that are going to be around you? Everything about you was God's sovereign hand putting people around you to shape you. We take so much credit. Now, humility says God did everything. Sneaky pride says, I did something. Come on now, did you, do dead people come out of graves? Did you come out of the grave on your own? No, oh, God called you forth. Right now, even as people are in here, the Holy Spirit's doing something in your heart. You don't do that. God awakens people, and then you respond to the gospel message, you get saved. Come on, look. sorry, I keep going. Um, pride makes you feel entitled. It makes you feel entitled. Pride does this, my problems are the most important. My success, my success is the most important. Pride makes things transactional, but love makes things relational. Prideful people, they look at people as tools to fix them. I'm entitled to relationships. You, be my friend. I'm entitled uh, to, uh, to a good life. You, work for me and make my life good. You look at people as transactional tools. Pride does that, but love makes things relational. I'm just here to make things better. I'm here to serve people. God is in control, is the next one Nebuchadnezzar would say. God is in control. While these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer the ruler of this kingdom. You'll be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals, and you'll eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdom of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. That's, that's God talking. So Nebuchadnezzar, hey, just give me a heads up. God let me know he is in control, control. Goes on to say, that same hour the judgment was fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like cow and he was drenched with the dew of heaven. He lived this way until his hair was long as eagles, feathers, and his nails were like birds and claws. Did anybody else play the game? How long do you think we're gonna be like this? I remember it being like May 2020. My buddies would call me like, hey, when do you think you'll have church back to normal? I was like, September 2020. Six months is what my prediction was. All my buddies were like, you have no faith. Six months, that's so long. We'll be back before that. <laughs> August 2021, we're back to Sundays. I had a lot of faith, it looked like. My faith was high, almost a year early. And so during this COVID journey, I 
started processing things differently. Stop trying to guess when this is over and just start living the way God wanted me to live. You know what I think is fascinating? I'm about the worst thing to come up. You know what I think is fascinating is that the uh, Israelites took 40 years to get to the promised land, but what's kind of scary is it was only an 11-day journey. So they couldn't learn about what they really needed was God. They wanted all of Egypt still. And he's like, oh my gosh, you guys even said to go back to Egypt. You are so silly. You know what I mean? Like, so, so for 40 years, they wandered. Instead of the 11-day journey, it should have been to get to the promise. Anybody love Waze? Waze? I love Waze. I love Waze. Um, I, Apple Maps is solid. I'm starting to become an Apple Map person more a little bit. But the reason why I love Waze is I hate traffic. I hate it. And so when I'm in traffic, I get on Waze and it's like, go take the service streets and like a, a 45 minutes in traffic and get down to 25 minutes. I'm here to tell you that God is the opposite of Waze. He's going to make it longer on purpose. <laughs> He's going to drive and say, get in the car. I know where we're supposed to go, but I'm not letting you out of this car until you have some joy, humility, honor, so you know I'm the driver. Oh, we can, we, can, we, can, we can stay in this car as long as you want. 11 days or 40 days, you get a pick. But as we journey, eventually, I will release you to your promise because finally you'll be able to steward your promise. The reality is, is though you're still in the car is because you still want to drive. The reality is, is you think that you have control. Trust me, we don't have control. More than ever, I'm realizing it. I feel so helpless. I feel so helpless with all the mandates. I feel so helpless with what's happening with the government right now. I feel so helpless. But in the midst of our calendar and wondering what's going on, I just, I just see God saying, no, I'm driving. And if you could just surrender and you would allow me to do what I need to do in your heart, ooh, the things I could do. Can I tell you something real quick? The story of Naaman, it was something I was looking at this week with pride and humility. One of God's prophets, Elijah, comes up to him and says, hey, you want to be healed? Go take a dip in the water seven times. Naaman's like, you know who I am? Nobody tells me what to do. Just snap your finger. Nobody tells me how to get healthy. Nobody tells me how to get old. And to dip for seven times? How dare you tell me to dip for seven times? That just sounds silly. Eventually, because Naaman was so broken, I'm going to finally go take that dip. If you know the story, by the seventh time, Naaman's body is healed. But on that first dip, I really believe that his heart was being transformed from arrogance to humility. All right. Second dip. All right. I'll submit to you. Third dip. All right. I'll honor my governor and president and my boss. Dip three. All right. I'll forgive people that I don't want to forgive. Dip four. All right. I will sacrifice and I'll put you first. Dip five. All right, God, I'm surrendering everything. Not the token air prayer. God, I give you everything. But really, you're not giving them everything. You go, God, I give you everything. Dip six. And by the seventh dip, there is a new man or a new woman that comes from that water. And it's called baptism. It's called being cleansed of the things of this world and you have a new life and it's not yours anymore. You know you're playing a part of a bigger story. There's just something special about being dipped in the water seven times. Some of you, this week, you have seven days in a week, take a dip every day. Every day, take a dip. Every day, just say, God, I'm, I'm, I spread the news and I'm angry. Grace. God, I, I, I want this to happen. I don't know if this is supposed to happen, God. Your kingdom come, you will be done. And just watch what God does in that journey. I want to leave you with this, and we'll, uh, we'll leave. There's another one I was going to share with you. We'll, I'll share it uh, another time. But honor the one who created the heavens and the earth. It's, uh, he finishes with just giving God honor. Uh, you're not going to make it into Babylon if you're giving honor to the wrong things dishonor disables. Um, when you dishonor people around you, if you dishonor your political leaders, it disables your voice. People don't like hearing from people who are just dishonorous. But people honor, like it just opens ears. We'll, we'll, we'll teach on that an, another day. But I love this conclusion. I want, you, I want your hope to grow. I want your hope to grow today. I wanna, I wanna read you Daniel 4, verse one. 
And Daniel 1 through 3 is Daniel writing, and Daniel 4, it's a debate between theologians. Did Nebuchadnezzar write this whole chapter, or did he speak it and Daniel write it? We don't know, but it's from, it's from Nebuchadnezzar's voice. This is Nebuchadnezzar getting a whole chapter in the Bible. And this is what King Nebuchadnezzar says in the very beginning. King Nebuchadnezzar set this message to the prophet of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. The man who was throwing people in fires, the man who was just hurting people is now the man bringing peace. When I was a young believer, I wanted to walk on water. My grandma told me about Jesus at age four. I learned all the cool Bible stories. So I remember being like eight years old and we'd fill the pool up. Did anybody else do this? Anybody else try to walk on water? My people, come on. So I'd, I'd read the story and be like, all right, God, all right, God, say come and I'll come. You know, like an eight-year-old. Okay, I think I heard you, you know? And then I'd, I'd walk on the pool and just fall in and I'd be like, oh, I need more faith, you know? And so I'd try to walk on it. And, you know, even as a little kid, I mean, these are little kid prayers. I'd, I'd go get a stick and I'd hear the Moses story and I'd have the pool and I'd be like, all right, Lord, let's, hey, just you and me, I won't tell anybody. Split the pool, ready? Split it. <laughs> Nothing. And I was somewhat obsessed with these big miracles in the Bible. I wanted the big miracles. I want, I want to see Red Sea split. I want to see people walk on water. Oh, I want it. And then I really got saved and I really started seeing church. And you read King Nebuchadnezzar. Hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace. That's a cool miracle. Daniel and the lion's den, we're going to cover that in, in, in a week or two. That's a cool miracle. But the greatest miracle to me in all of Daniel is the one that was farthest from God coming to know God. His name is Nebuchadnezzar. The greatest miracle is salvation. The greatest miracle is a grave being conquered. The greatest miracle is death being conquered. Can you imagine if Gavin Newsom this next week said, I gotta tell you something, peace and prosperity, you California. There is a most high and his name is Jesus and I worship my God. I'm unashamed of my God. That would be like walking on water. We saw our governors and political leaders saying that. Uh, the heads of, can you imagine Mark Zuckerberg just coming out? Hey guys, I built this great thing called Facebook. It's nothing compared to the kingdom of God. Oh, I praise my God. I'm starting a new Facebook. It's called God Book. You know, something really cheesy, you know? You know, can you imagine the CEO of Google saying, I had a dream and I got saved and I'm changing my name of Google to Pursuing God Online. Those are miracles that we should contend for. Those are miracles we should believe for because hope grows. Hope believes that those who are farthest from God, like Nebuchadnezzar, can come to know God. This is a church that's going to believe. And in spite of Babylon right now, in the spite of those who are throwing rocks right now, in the spite of mandate after mandate, that God is not done in Mission Church and in the Bay Area. Come on. Will you bow your heads? I don't know if it's your first time or second time or third time in church, but there is something to be said about when you say yes to Jesus for the first time. Yes to salvation. Yes to heaven, no to hell. Yes to blessing, no to cursing. When you come to the house of God, you hear the gospel message. And the gospel message is simple. That somebody died for you, somebody paid the price for you, and his name is Jesus. And he did this for one reason, so you could have heaven with him. But not only have heaven with him, but have it heaven now. And so with every head bowed and eye closed, you want to say yes to Jesus. The Bible says confess through the mouth, believe in your heart, you'll be saved. If you want to be saved today, I want you to raise your hand and catch my eye and say, I want Jesus today. Go ahead and raise it up. I see you and I see you and I see you and I see you and I see you. Come on. We pray for sleepy Christians today. Sleepy Christians are people who have kind of been doing their own thing and they've just been missing out on the fullness of life because they're not living for God. You don't even have to raise your hand. I just want to pray for you real quick. I want to pray that when you leave here, that just something happens. Something happens this week in your hunger for God and his word and his presence. So God, we lift up sleepy Christians. We lift up casual Christianity, crossless Christianity. We say that this is going to be a season where a ton of Christians are going to pick up their cross again and say, Lord, for me to follow you, I've got to carry my own cross. Oh Lord, we love you. Use Mission Church. Oh God, we love you, we love you. Everybody said?